Imagine if we could go back in time one century and tell people back then that in 100 years from now, doctors will be creating human life in a Petri dish as a matter of course, that scientists near Geneva will have created a 17-mile tube in which they've collided two particles at such immense speed that it has literally recreated the conditions that were present at the beginning of the universe. They would balk in disbelief. And yet, science has given this to us, and it has only just begun. Where science will take us in the next 100 years is anybody's guess, and the possibilities are literally endless. But notwithstanding the rapid rate at which the world has evolved and changed, and the incredible speed at which it's all happening, at a, a level un, unparalleled to anything we've experienced in human history, there remains one single constant, one core element of the human condition that has never changed and will never change, that has been with us since the dawn of civilization and will be with us until the end of time. And that is the human desire for companionship, the human need to love and be loved, the art of human altruism, the warmth of the human embrace. No science, no technology, no machine and no device will ever be able to replace these. Sadly, quite the opposite is true. Psychologists today are telling us, in study after study, that the advancement of technology and social media in particular has created greater levels of anxiety, depression, isolation and loneliness, especially among young people. So the question for us, for our generation, the generation that is the recipient and the beneficiary of this wonderful technology, and we should embrace and welcome that technology, what are we going to do to ensure that those amongst us who are vulnerable, those who have fallen through the cracks, those who might be experiencing that sense of loneliness, are brought back into the fold, are brought back into the tent, and most importantly, are given a sense of belonging, meaning and purpose in life. We cannot have the privilege of science in our generation unless we accept with it the responsibility to ensure that those who are suffering in silence are given the means through which to live their lives. Eighteen years ago, I encountered the most terrifying experience of my life, and it was also one of its most transformative. I was finishing my second year as a gap year, as it were, just after finishing high school. I was traveling in New York. I was booked on a flight to come back here to Melbourne. The plan at that point was to study law, graduate and give to the world just what it needs, another Jewish lawyer. <laughs> it's wonderful how Jewish mothers have really expanded our horizons. It used to be medicine and law, and today it's medicine, law or accounting. It's wonderful. <laughs> I was sitting on the flight, and we were inching up the tarmac at LaGuardia Airport. The skies were clear, there were no winds, there was no turbulence, we were next to take off. We waited and waited and waited. That morning, our flight never took off. Only moments earlier, United Airlines Flight 11 had crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Centers in a day that would change the world forever. Entire U.S. airspace was shut down without notice, and every single airport in the United States was evacuated immediately. We were herded out, our luggage was left behind, and I vividly recall as we came out onto the, into the terminals, there were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people running out. It was pandemonium. It felt like the apocalypse and the Armageddon all at once. It was terrifying. Fear was struck into the hearts and eyes of people. The fear was so palpable in the air that you could literally cut it with a knife. And I recall we waited about one hour till I finally was able to get a taxi because the line was so long. And as we were driving back to Brooklyn, where I was staying, we were passing, by that point, the South Tower had also been hit, and the taxi driver, a New York local, and I were looking up over Manhattan, we could see it. And it was 10.03 in the morning, and then it happened. The South Tower collapsed into a heap of rubble. The taxi driver was in absolute disbelief and totally disoriented. It was the most visceral, terrifying, visual experience I'd ever had 
and the image will be etched in my mind until the day that I die. I got back to Brooklyn, and to be completely honest with you, the rest of the day is a complete blur. I was numb and emotionally paralyzed. I passed out on the couch, woke up the next morning, pinched myself to see, is this real? Did this actually happen? And of course it was. I went to synagogue that morning, and I sat there in front of the prayer book to start the prayers, but I was stuck. I was frozen. I realized I had this incredible sense of detachment. I didn't feel detached from God or detached from religion. I felt detached from myself. And all of a sudden, all of the ontological and existential questions that so many of us ask in life at one point or another started to rush through my head. Who am I? But more importantly, what is my purpose in existence? And I realized that I did not want to live in a world that did not actively and consciously counter the baseless hatred that leads to an ideology that sees the other as the enemy. I wanted to live in and contribute to a world that sees the other as an extension of myself, that sees the entirety of humanity, irrespective of who we are and what are our belief, from theists to atheists, everything in between, as one common core humanity working towards the same goal, which is the betterment of people so everyone can benefit from this world. And so I decided right there and then that law was not for me, and instead I wanted to become a rabbi. I wanted to engage in people's lives in meaningful ways. I wanted to be a part of their life and for them to be a part of mine. I wanted to become a human being who feels with other human beings. I didn't want to live on a conveyor belt of life, just going through the monotonous and perfunctory way in which sometimes we can fall into that trap of living. And I can tell you now that 18 years later, it was the second best decision I ever made in my life, second only to marrying the woman I love. Because whenever I encounter my congregants, whether I've seen them recently or in the past, never once have they said to me, Rabbi, you know when I felt most connected to you? It's when you were up sermonizing on the pulpit or lecturing from the lectern. They're usually sleeping then, that's a separate discussion. <laughs> We felt connected when you danced with us at our daughter's wedding when you cried with us at our father's funeral, when you sat with us without judgment and without precondition, listening to us pouring our heart out. Mistakes we all make, and I've made my fair share. And from them we learn, and from them we grow. But to me, what mattered the most was that these experiences are real, and that we are in the present, and that we have mindfulness and consciousness while we experience them. This, I believe, is the call of our generation. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, as we do progress further in this world of technology, are we going to forget to anchor ourselves into our core, into who we are as human beings, to that quintessential point at which we are all ultimately one single unit? Viktor Frankl was a neurologist and a psychiatrist, He also happened to have the great misfortune of being Jewish in Nazi Germany. He suffered for three years in the concentration camps in Dachau and Auschwitz. He was one of the lucky ones who survived. And when he did survive, he went on to create a new form of therapy. It became known as the third of the three Viennese schools of psychotherapy. He was preceded, of course, by two of the greats, Sigmund Freud and Friedrich Nietzsche. All three of them asked exactly the same question. What is it that motivates human behavior? What is it that drives human nature? Yet all three arrived at very different conclusions. Freud believed that what drives human nature is the will to pleasure. Nietzsche believed that it was the will to power. And Viktor Frankl revolutionized our way of thinking and said that it is the will to purpose that every experience in life, both positive and negative, has purpose and is imbued with meaning. And whilst Freud and Nietzsche had different ways of looking at it, ultimately, both of their beliefs, whether one was driven to pleasure or driven to power and control, 
both coalesced around the same thing, the self. Until Viktor Frankl came along and said that there is a possibility that humans are driven for something bigger than just ourselves. Possibility that we are driven to connect with others in humanity and find purpose in that journey. And the most amazing and incredible thing about Viktor Frankl is that he didn't just talk the talk, he practiced what he preached. One evening, late at night, towards the middle of the night, he received a phone call from an, inc an incredibly distraught woman. She told him clearly and slowly that she intended to end her life that evening. Frankel stayed on the phone with her and talked her through her issues and communicated to her reason after reason why it was worth carrying on living. Ultimately, she reneged. She committed not to self-harm, and she was true to her word. And a few days later, the two of them met. And Frankel asked her, tell me, which of the reasons I gave you that night was the one that finally persuaded you to continue living? Her response was phenomenal. She said, none. It's not what you said to me that night, but the fact that you sat through the night with me and said it. You demonstrated to me a world in which where one person is willing to reach out and to share the burden of another human being, that is the wor a world in which I want to live. And that, I believe, is the question that we need to ask ourselves today. Technology is not going to stop. It's going to get better and faster. But we must always remember that there will be people falling through the cracks. I want to leave you with one anecdote, which to me was so powerful and life-changing. In the 20th, 19th and 20th century, one of the greatest musicians of all time, his name was Arturo Toscanini. He was a brilliant mind and an amazing conductor. And at that point in his life, he, he died in 1957, he was one of the few people who vocally spoke out against fascism in all its forms. He fought against Hitler and rejected his invitation to come and play music for him. One day, his biographer called and said, I want to come over and I want to interview you tomorrow. Toscanini said no. He said, tonight, there is a symphony playing over 600 miles away. I used to conduct that symphony, and I cannot be there, but I want to hear it over shortwave radio, which in those days was a big deal. The biographer said, it would be my greatest pleasure to sit with you and just watch you in this experience. Toscanini acquiesced. That night, the biographer came over, watched him listen to the symphony, and at the end, the biographer said, that was amazing. What did you think? Toscanini said no. There was one violinist missing that night. There were supposed to be 120 musicians. 14 out of 15 violinists came. One was absent. How could you possibly know that, he said. He said, that's the difference between you and me. You are listening as a member of the audience, but I was listening as a conductor. And in my mind, every single note is indispensable. What an incredible metaphor in life. Our lives, this world, is a symphony but it's a symphony that only makes sense when the tapestry of music sung by every single human being is allowed to come into fruition. And every single person here and every human being on the planet has their instrument and their music to play. But if even one is missing, we can go through life as part of the audience and not even notice, or we can be a conductor. We can have faith in ourselves and faith in others and allow that person to have the voice inspire them to share their music. And I can promise you this. One of the greatest Jewish mystics in history, the Baal Shem Tov, said that a person can live 70 or 80 years in this world just to do a single favor for another person. Let's be that person who does that favor. And when we reach out to someone else and inspire them to play their music, our own music becomes all the more beautiful to listen to. Thank you.